There are two very important industrial processes that you need to know about. One is the harbour process, which is named after a guy called Fritz Harbour. He actually got a Nobel Prize for this, and that's where nitrogen gas reacts with hydrogen gas to make ammonia. And the reason he got a Nobel Prize for it was basically because ammonia is used to make fertilizers, and without ammonia, we simply would not have enough food to feed the world population. I know that you may argue we don't anyway, but it would be a hell of a lot worse without ammonia and fertilizers. The other one's called the contact process. Now again, a very important process where sulfur dioxide is combined with oxygen to make sulfur trioxide. This in turn then is dissolved in water to make sulfuric acid, which again is a very important chemical. Sulfuric acid is used in lots and lots of industries, the dye industry, the paint industry, um, it's used in um, lots of chemical production. It's also used to make um, sulfuric acid, as we said, which of course combines with ammonia to make ammonium sulfate, which is one of the most commonly used fertilizers. The fact is they're both very important processes and you need to know a little bit about both of them. Now, in both cases, we need to maximize the yield of product, but we also need to keep an eye on rate of reaction as well, because if you are an industrial chemist, you need to obviously get a compromise between the two. It's no good getting a fantastic yield if it's too slow. It's no good having it fantastically quick if you don't get much yield. You've got to compromise. In the harbor process, the conditions they use are a high pressure, usually around about 200 atmospheres. It varies, but that's about right. They use a temperature of about 450 degrees centigrade, and they use an iron catalyst. In the contact process, they use pressures probably just over an atmosphere. They use a temperature of around about the same, and the catalyst this time is called vanadium 5 oxide. Now, at the start of this chemistry unit, in Unit 3, we did chemical equilibrium and learned about Le Chatelier's principle and how reversible reactions can be moved one way or the other, depending on conditions. You will definitely need to understand why these conditions are being used. Firstly, why do we use a high pressure in the harbour process? Well, you can see that on the left-hand side, there are four lots of gas. On the right-hand side, two lots of gas. It doesn't matter what the chemical nature of the gas is. It just needs to be gas. So four lots of gas is going to occupy a lot more volume and exert a lot more pressure than two lots of gas. Le Chatelier says that if you make a change to a system in equilibrium, the system will shift to oppose you. So if I am going to increase the pressure on this, then the system will shift to the right to obviously reduce the pressure by making less gas. Hence, a better yield of ammonia. The forward reaction for both of these is exothermic. So you might say, well, why use high temperature? Because high temperature favors an endothermic process. So that clearly doesn't go with favoring the formation of the product. However, remember what we said, you can't ignore rate. And if you don't use a temperature of at least 450, the rate is so slow that you simply don't produce your product quick enough to, to, your to, get to, to sell to your customers. Okay? The fact that you use a catalyst will obviously speed it up as well. The catalyst will provide an alternative route. It lowers the activation energy barrier, which again allows more molecules to get over and speeds up the reaction. The only thing that does seem a little bit puzzling is the pressure here, because the same argument applies for the harbor process as to the contact process. There are three lots of gas on the left and two on the right. 
So a high pressure would obviously favor the forward reaction and get a better yield of sulfur trioxide. So why don't we use it? Well, firstly, pressure is one, very expensive, and two, prone to burst pipes and stuff like that. So you don't use a high pressure unless you have to. In the harbour process, even with that pressure, the yield of ammonia is probably no more than 20%. So you need that high pressure. Otherwise, the yield is so low it's not worth having. However, at just over atmospheric pressure, the yield of sulfur trioxide is almost 100%. So clearly, you don't need to use a high pressure. You don't use high pressure unless you have to, and you don't have to here. There are two biofuels that the syllabus requires you to know about. One is biodiesel, and the other one is ethanol. Biodiesel is very, very similar in the way if you remember an earlier video where we said how soap was made, biodiesel is made in a very similar way. There's just one or two slight differences. If this is your vegetable oil or fat, then before biodiesel came along, this would have just been disposed of. And it's, it's very wasteful if there's any way you could possibly use it again. So this is how it works. Instead of disposing it, what we do is hydrolyze it. Now remember, you can hydrolyze this with acid or alkali, or you can use an enzyme like a lipase. And the hydrolysis will essentially break the bonds here, here, and here. That will create then the alcohol, propane 1,2,3-triol, glycerol, and three separate carboxylic acid chains. Now then, what they do, instead of then using an alkali to make soap, what they do is put in methanol in that hydrolysis process. What that then happens is, instead of the carboxylic acids forming as carboxylic acids, they react with the methanol and form new esters. But instead of it being an ester, which looks like a big figure E, these are individual chains with an ester group on the end. In fact, it's the methyl ester, which will be there, there and there. So what, effectively what we're doing is, is this, creating three separate long chain hydrocarbons. Now diesel, you probably remember from fraction distillation days, is about twice the length of a petrol molecule. So maybe about 16 carbons, which is exactly what these are. And the fact that there's an oxygen or two on the end isn't gonna make any difference at all to how these things combust. So these things can work in a normal diesel engine. And what it means is, instead of throwing away all this vegetable oil and fats, which they used to do, they can now create a biofuel, something which one, avoids waste, and two, obviously, is very cost-effective. So it's coming into a bit of green chemistry, which is a video yet to come. Okay, so that's biodiesel, first of all. That's the first of the biofuels. Incidentally, the, the name given to the changeover from the triester to the methyl ester of each individual chain is called, it's quite a long word, but it makes sense, Trans esterification. Wow, just fitted that in. Okay, trans esterification is turning one ester, the big figure E ester, into three separate esters using methanol in the hydrolysis process. Okay, so that's the first one. The second biofuel we need to know about is probably more familiar to you, and that is ethanol. Ethanol, obviously, is something which is consumed in alcoholic drinks, but it is also used as a fuel. You will probably recall that most petrol stations now have an E10 pump, which means that there's 10% ethanol mixed in with the petrol. And in some countries like Brazil, where sugarcane is very, very common, they would have probably cars that run on 
I'm not sure about pure ethanol, but certainly a higher percentage than just 10%. So ethanol is made, as we hopefully will remember from our earlier chemistry days, by fermentation of a sugar like glucose. So if we take C6H12O6 and we ferment this, now fermentation is effectively like an anaerobic process. It doesn't use oxygen. If we use oxygen here, this will combust and form carbon dioxide and water. We don't want that. Instead, we use um, an enzyme which is present in the fungus yeast, and that feeds on the glucose and turns it into ethanol and carbon dioxide. They are simply waste products. So we would have ethanol, which is C2H5OH and CO2, and I think we need two there and two there to balance the equation. So this is one way of making the biofuel ethanol from crops like sugarcane or corn, which of course are renewable fuels. The only problem here is we are using the enzymes in yeast. And yeast is a living organism, a fungus. And unfortunately, the waste product ethanol that it gets rid of during metabolism poisons the yeast and you can't get much more than about, if you're lucky, about 15% ethanol. So it's a pretty poor yield. This is, of course, how we make alcoholic drinks, beers, wines, and so on. These, these are made by the process of fermentation. If you want to make a much purer ethanol, then, of course, you have to use something which is not so desirable, and that is the reaction between ethene and steam, which we met earlier when we did the basic organic chemistry. This will involve H2O, not water, but steam. It requires high pressures, it requires high temperatures, and it requires a catalyst. And ethene to ethanol is a very, very efficient process. You could get yields approaching 100%, but ethene is not a renewable fuel. Sugar cane is. Ethene comes from, remember, crude oil. We simply take the fractions from crude oil, crack them, and we make alkenes like ethene. So because crude oil is involved in this process, it wouldn't be as environmentally friendly as making this. So even though ethanol is a biofuel, it's not essentially a biofuel if you make it from ethene. This video is about uh, fuel cells. Um, from an environmental point of view, what we're doing here is using hydrogen and oxygen to make water and using the energy produced by that reaction to generate power and electricity. They're really, really simple. If you have your data book and you turn to page 10, you will find the list of standard electric potentials and the equations you see in the board, the ones that are all in green, are all on this page given to you by QCAA. So there are two types of fuel cell. There is an acidic fuel cell, there's an alkaline fuel cell. The acidic ones involve hydrogen ions and the alkaline ones involve hydroxide ions. So when you are looking for these in that data table, keep that in mind. If you want the acidic one, you want the equations involving hydrogen with H+, plus. and if you want the alkaline one, you want the equations involving oxygen and OH-. minus. Okay, now then, um, in both cases, I should have said, hydrogen and oxygen are both being used. They are the reactants, and the product in each, each, each case is water. You will see, if you combine these two equations together, and if you combine those two equations together, you'll actually end up with exactly the same reaction, and that will be 2H2 plus O2 giving 2H2O. If you're using the half equations for the acidic one, you will need hydrogen gas becoming H plus and two electrons. Now, obviously, we have reversed this because in the chart, they're all written as reductions. 
However, because hydrogen is zero, it doesn't really make any difference. The other half equation you will need is oxygen. Obviously, if hydrogen is in one, oxygen is in the other. And the half equation for this one has an E0 value of 1.23 volts. Put them together and we get an overall value of 1.23 volts. If you're doing the alkaline one, hydrogen again is reacting with oxygen, but this time using hydroxide ions because it's an alkaline fuel cell. The hydrogen plus hydroxide ion giving that. Now again, remember, they're written as reductions in the data book. So this would now be the other way around in the data book and would have a value of minus 0.83. We have reversed that equation because we want it as an oxidation, not as a reduction, and therefore we change the sign to plus 0.83. The other one involving oxygen is going in the direction according to the data book and keeps the sign plus 0.4. When you put those two together, again, you get an overall voltage of plus 1.23 volt, which shouldn't surprise you because effectively, both of them end up with exactly the same overall equation. So that's fuel cells. This is tagged into the syllabus in the latter part of Unit 4 because it comes hand in hand with the biofuels and green chemistry and an attempt to produce energy in a much more environmentally friendly way rather than use fossil fuels.